Uh, thank you for coming over here today and go ahead and get started. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And here I will be talking today about the bunch of work I do predominantly with neutral hydrogen in galaxies. It's an incredible time to study neutral hydrogen in galaxies right now because I hope many of you heard about the upcoming SKA Square Kilometer Array Radio Telescope, which will completely re revolutionize, hopefully, our understanding about this missing puzzle, missing piece of galaxy formation and evolution. And it has been a missing piece in the cosmological context because it's extremely faint and it hasn't been observable up to redshift zero up to now. So only now with SK pathfinders, we start to get the cosmological sense out of it observationally. So it's exciting time to be there and I'm very happy to share it with you. So neutral hydrogen, atomic hydrogen, or simple H1, how we call it, it's a simple atom, which consists of proton and an electron with aligned spins. And as soon as the spins get misaligned, the photon is emitted of a wavelength of 21 centimeters and the rest frequency. And this is how we can observe it using radio telescopes. For each one, we're using two types of radio telescopes. So it can be a single dish array, which will be lacking a spatial resolution of your data, but will produce your nice spectra from which many H1 measurables already can be calculated, like H1 mass of a galaxy or its rotation, maximum rotational velocity by measuring the width of the profile. If you build many single dishes and you will combine it together in interferometer, as many of you in heart know and work a lot in radio interferometer for the continuum survey, you can observe little de details with finer spatial resolution of your data and you will end up with data which looks sort of like this for a galaxy where you have your x and y coordinate and the third dimension for velocity. If you follow the third dimension, you can build a rotation model of your galaxy where you will not have only one data point for rotations, but you can follow the rotation as a function of radius. So you can observe, you can study much finer structure of uh, H1 in the galaxy and as well as its kinematics, which is important for many purposes. So why is H1 important and what can we learn by studying H1 in galaxies? So first of course, it, galaxy structure and kinematics because H1 disks give you nice extended rotation curves. It's much more extended than the optical rotation curves, for example. As well as H1, it's not as gravitationally bound as, for example, stars or CO. So it's very, it's very diffuse and it extends further into dark matter halo. So it would be the first tracer which would affect on an, on an, uh, which will be affected by the environment. So if your galaxy is going through processing type of merger, type of interaction, each one is the first <coughs> component which will experience any sort of environmental effect. So it's also extremely interesting to study it for environment. Of course, for the large scale structure and for the formation of galaxies, we can study the fundamental properties like H1 mass function, which is a number of galaxies in a particular volume arranged by the H1 mass. Now it's also been very emerging topic of study H1 properties of galaxies with respect to their cosmic filaments and cosmic webs, as well as trying to map the cold accretion from the cosmic filament, which is supposed to consist of very low column density H1 gas. Uh, and of course we can calculate important cosmological properties such as omega H1, so H1, cosmic density, H1 gas fractions, and of course, H1 is a raw fuel for star formation. You don't associate it very well with star formation, but H2 for being formed from H1 and then for stars. So basically it's the raw most pristine fuel for star formation. And here is more interesting points to take for this. For example, if you will look at the stellar light distribution of a galaxy, will be small, simple galaxy. If you will look at its scale in H1, you will see how much more extended H1 is, how this galaxy has a warp and already undergoing some interactions. This is an example of a galaxy which is in falling into a cluster, proper stellar body, nothing special. When we will look at H1, we see that H1 has been pushed by REM pressure splitting. This is H1 in contours. So again, the tracer of the environment 
as well as here, one of my favorite examples is MIT1 group. You look at the optical, it's not very, very deep optical imaging, some deeper optical imaging, you can see already some traces. But when you look at it at each one, which was done back in 94, you will see that the whole system is connected. There is like rings and bridges and a lot of interaction going on within galaxies, which you would not pick up in the optical. And of course, new population of galaxies, which were discovered only thanks to each one, is the ultra faint, almost dark galaxies. They have almost zero stars, very, very faint stellar population and extremely extended H1 stellar disk. These are the galaxies where the baryonic mass consists purely of H1. <clears throat> I've been giving these talks for many years. Since I started my PhD, I was supposed to work on all these exciting SK pathfinders written here, but it's always been a future because the survey is getting delayed all the time, all the time, for tens of years, tens of years, you probably know it with me. <laughs> I'm part of it, so I know what it means. And so I, in purpose, keep the future here, but now it's finally becoming the present. So now we have what we call a wedding cake of H1 surveys conducted with SK pathfinders happening right now, finally. Every telescope is in full operational mode, conducting and collecting data for each survey. So why the wedding cake? If we go from the first year to the last year, it's basically area versus volume. So volume, we will cover a very large area, but not very, go very deep into the redshift. And then as far as go further, area even decreases, but the volume and the depth of the survey increases because what we want to sample, it's not only like many galaxies at zero redshift, which we already sort of know about it. But what we want to do for the first time is to trace this cosmic evolution. What we want for the first time is to detect H1 above 0 0.25, which is now the furthest away detection of neutral hydrogen in the mission. And the, the top tiers are conducted with Mirka telescope. One of them is right now, pre-SK is the best radio interferometer, is the most sensitive radio interferometer with the best resolution. It has both. It's uh, situated in South Africa in Karoo Desert, so also very nice facilities and infrastructure and expertise there on site to operate the telescope. And I particularly am a group lead for the mighty H1 survey uh, with Matt Jarvis and Oxford NPI of the whole mighty, because the good thing about Meerkat that it can observe in three different modes simultaneously. So you get the survey for polarization, continuum, and spectral line. Uh, so, and it's now one of the most complete surveys for H1 ever undertaken because it has good area as well as a good volume. So for the first time we can trace H1 up to redshift 0 0.6 over a good amount of area. So we can also sample different environments and volumes. So here's a little bit about my TH1 survey. So as I said, Meerkat is a fantastic telescope, and with MITE we get resolution sensitivity, so we can probe diffuse very low column density H1 gas at very good resolution. And we have large frequency coverage, so we have cover large bandwidth, and we can go deeper in the redshift. Mm -hmm. This is the amount of galaxies predicted for us to observe. This band is completely out due to RFI. Nothing we can do about this, unfortunately, this window on the universe will be forever a mystery for us due to satellites and all other radio frequency interference issues. And we will be covering this field, section of LSS, Cosmos, PCDF, and light. All data has been taken and we are processing now the Cosmos data with the upgraded correlator, which has a velocity resolution of 5.5 kilometers per second. I will talk about it further. And what is extremely important for us and what makes MITE extremely unique in this sense, we have a wealth of ancillary data for all these fields. We have excellent photometry coverage. Um, uh, we have MUSE data, ALMA data. Basically, we try to combine the whole consensus of data we can for these fields because H1 alone is good but you always need to have ancillary information to combine everything into a piece of puzzle. 
So what I will be talking today is my CH1 early science data. This uh, early science has been conducted with the correlator, which only work in 4K mode, what we say, so the velocity resolution of our H1 data was 40 kilometers per second. Not ideal, we missed a lot of dwarfs, which rotate much smaller, for example, or like our rotation curves were not sampled as well. Or we tried to do as much possible science with it. And the first detections we got was 274 detections up to this redshift range, so almost up to 0 0.1. And it is the first time an interferometer has been able to observe a blank field of a completely unbiased, completely unbiased blank field up to this redshift because before this service were conducted but were pointed to the cluster, to specific group or specific environment. So the first time we sample whatever is coming our way. So it's a completely blind survey. Uh, our detections follow expected MH1 M star relation, which is not linear, but for us it was important to understand that our H1 measurements are correct simply because it was a new instrument and calibration and everything else really needed a lot of attention. Oh, this is our detection as a part of the field. So we only observed Cosmos and XMML assets for them, early science data. And here they're color coded by the H1 mass <clears throat> with Meerkat primary beam centered here. So quite a lot of detections, very gas rich. And out of this, 273 detections, poor velocity resolution. We managed to get quite a bit of science done, just thanks for Mirka being an amazing instrument. Uh, and lots of this science has been led by early career researchers and early career South African researchers. For us, it was very important to do this transfer of knowledge and support South African astronomy for hosting this amazing instrument. And I want to advertise for people who want who will be joining IU General Assembly that we will have a, a symposium on neutral hydrogen already towards the SK era in Cape Town on straight after GIS. When you said blank field before, what do you mean exactly? Uh, that it was just um, pointing in the cosmos field and not in a specific target. So it wasn't Cosmos yes, it was a cosmos field. Yeah, what I mean, blank star, it wasn't cluster or group or one galaxy because that's how it's usually been done in the past. So we didn't know what we were going to get. And since I still have privilege to do science myself, which I'm excited about, today I wanted to highlight some of the recent results I've got with the, my DH1 survey. And they are highlighted here. And first of all, first one is the H1 mass function. Why it was important H1 mass function than before with many more amount of galaxies before. However, it was the first H1 mass function ever done by interferometer to this redshift. And again, over untargeted field, not blank field, untargeted field. So some of them were done over the cluster of the group. So it was the first time done with interferometer up to this redshift and O1 targeted field. So what is H1 mass function and why do we want it? Why do we need it? And why do we calculate it? So basically the shape of any mass function determines how the gas stars or whatever you accounted in the universe are distributed over the galaxies of different mass in a particular volume. And what's important about stellar mass function in combination with H1 mass function, because they all go into the cosmological simulation of galaxy formation evolution, they all Right, Rob? <laughs> they all need to any model, any cosmological gas information evolution model, supposed to reproduce these values at redshift zero. So you better be sure that you measure them correctly. So the state of the art H1 mass function has been conducted with an alpha alpha survey up to this redshift. For us, it's already a good redshift range. I'm sorry for the high redshift people. <laughs> And the alpha alpha was a survey conducted by a receiver telescope, which unfortunately has been destroyed recently. Uh, and it's a single dish telescope. So they, it's very sensitive. So they could detect many galaxies. They could not resolve any of them. So they could only calculate the H1 mass from the spectra and count and calculate them. And the important thing is that, as I said, uh, it goes into the theories of galaxy formation evolution constraint. Uh, 
together each one mass function and stellar mass function can tell us more about the baryon fractions and the dark matter halos. Uh, and of course, by integrated after under H1 mass function, we can calculate the cosmic H1 density and basically put the constraint of what is the cosmic H1 density now at redshift zero. The shape of the H1 mass function is also very important because it tells you about different variations of uh, the distribution of galaxy of this particular mass. So it consists of low mass slope or alpha and the knee mass of this what we call the knee mass at the higher mass and an exponential decline and basically uh, if you will sample many galaxies over many environments you will have something like exponential alpha slope like for alpha alpha 100 if you look only in groups and clusters you will see a deficiency in low mass galaxies so the the slow the low mass slope of the h1 mass function become flat almost completely flat, so there is no increase in the low mass galaxies, and this is exactly because they are losing the H1 when they're entering the dense area. And what we know so far, because we couldn't observe H1 at higher ratio, but what we know, for example, from semi-analytical models of galaxy formation evolution, that the shape of H1 mass function should evolve with time, and there are exact predictions of how it should evolve, that, a, that alpha should get steeper and the knee mass should go down. So basically by analyzing not only the integrated value, but the shape, we can say what's going on here. So the highest, the high redshift H1 mass function up to date has been observed with a receiver ultra deep survey. It goes up to 0 0.16. And they don't find any significant evolution over this redshift range as expected. However, there is another study which looked at the H1 mass function at a cluster environment in 0 0.2. And what they find is indeed that the slope is getting steeper and the, H, the knee mass is getting down. So maybe it is a hint of evolution, but that was conducted over a cluster. So it's a very pre-processed environment this probably many foreground galaxies also on the way so we cannot get exact conclusions does it evolve does the shape of h1 mass function evolved over this period or not so what we did is we looked at our mighty h1 data and we looked for the first meerkat h1 mass function again we needed to prove that everything's working and we're getting correct result and this is the first interferometric of AP blank field so what we find, likely, is that we are mostly in agreement with alpha alpha, which is already great because they have thousands of more galaxies than we do. But thanks for the statistics, we are in very good agreement. Moreover, because Mirkat is so sensitive, we can also sample low mass end and the knee mass pretty well. And it is unexpectedly because we don't have neither area nor very deep volume, but because we go further in redshift, we detect more H1 massive galaxies at higher redshift. And because we st it's very sensitive, we also detect lots of smaller galaxies to constrain both and the slope and normalization and the knee mass. And uh, here is our an example of how we do in comparison to all other surveys. And even the errors are large because they're driven by statistics. We are pretty much in in range with previous observations. Uh, and from this paper, we could also spread it into two different samples and include the evolution into the fitting term. And of course we find no evolution. It would be very surprising if we did because it would contradict everything we know and believe so far about the evolution of H1. And when we look at the H1 mass function over two different fields separately, we cannot sample it properly. And this is, was an important lesson for us to learn that you need much larger volume. But for example, if you go only for Cosmos, only for XMMLSS, you will sample very different galaxies out there. So you need to sample lots of volume in order to be able to tackle different environments. And of course, as I mentioned already, if you integrate under H1 mass function, you can get omega H1, which is an H1 cosmic density. And H1, pay attention here, H1 cosmic density has been measured 
up to rates of six, but all these measurements are very inconsistent with each other in terms of technique. So the highest redshifts are done measuring um, H1 plasmic density through the DLA absorbers. There is a lot of stacking experiments has been done. And only this narrow range was based on the direct H1 detections where you can know that you're measuring H1 and you're measuring H1 in galaxies. And here is the domain of this range where we show many. Ah, and the dash line here is predictions from SIMBA hydrodynamical simulations. So simulations can reproduce the observed decline in omega H1 pretty well. However, if we will look at our results, we find that it's actually higher than previously was reported from the similar surveys. So of course the errors are large, but it's something to pay attention to because if we will put it together on the population plot, we will see that it's mostly flat up to reaching 0 0.6, 0 0.5 as far as we have measurements. So we are not sure if there is decline or not. And again, we have large error bars due to small amount of smaller amount of galaxies, but Meerkat is extremely sensitive. So I think with the full survey, we're really expecting some, some new findings in terms of omega H1 and the constraints we can put. And here is some preliminary results for the evolution of H1 mass function using different techniques. Uh, in, in orange is the alpha-alpha H1 mass function with redshift zero. And other three are from redshift 0 0.3, but using very different techniques. One is from stacking, one from intensity mapping, and another one from stacking, but from IT survey. So they're all pretty different. And they all suggest that even though the cosmic H1 density, so the total integral is not expected to change. The shape of H1 mass function is expected to change quite a bit, and it is something we want to understand better in the future. And, and here's my conclusion for this part. Mm. Sorry, and but most important to say that blind surveys with the SKH1 pathfinder will already yield a lot of galaxies, very small galaxies, as, as well as the, high mass galaxies at higher redshift across all different environments. And thanks to each one, to Meerkat sensitivity and resolution, we will be able to finally detect them and not use statistical techniques to infer some number. And of, of course, with SK, we will be ready for it to come and to study more what's happening. And now I will be moving from just count galaxies <laughs> to more detailed physics and understanding of them because we can resolve them so we can look inside in more details. And another thing which I studied with our new data is the telefish relation and actually the, the hint for the evolution of the telefish relation with H1. So the telefish is a general power law which holds for all these galaxies, which links the luminosity of the galaxy and its rotational rate. Originally, it was used to determine distance to galaxies when you have your well-defined telefish relation with well-known distances from alternative surveys. And you know the top absolute luminosity of the galaxies, you can measure the rotational rate from H1 spectrum. And then when you don't have a galaxy, you, you can press it here, push it here, and infer the distance modulus. However, being first used to determine distances to galaxies, it was found out that it actually holds much more fundamental meaning for the formation evolution of galaxies and for galaxies in total because luminosity is a proxy for stellar mass and further it was asserted as a proxy for the baryonic mass of the galaxy and rotational velocity is a proxy for the dark matter halo mass and for total dynamics of the galaxy. So the Lefisch relation has been used widely since 2000 for, to test cosmological models of galaxy formation evolution together with alternative scenarios. Uh, to lambda CDM, like for example, MOND or hydro simulation, because every theory needs to place galaxies on this observed relation. As I said, the, the evolution of the axis has been dramatic from just photographic plates and luminosities to the total baryonic mass when we can include stellar mass and H1 mass into the onto the y axis. And the rotational velocity also improved because first, 
the H1 was measured with single dish telescope, just one number, which roughly corresponds to V max. Now we could get derive proper rotation curves, which is the velocity of a galaxy as a function of radius. They think everybody knows about rotation curves, they are flat. So they're probably one of the most demonstrative examples of the dark matter present in galaxies. And the good thing about each one rotation curves, they are extended much further into dark matter hill, much more than the stellar disk. So the flat part at the outskirts of the rotation curve is supposed to trace the halo potential and be linked to the dark matter halo directly. Right now, the telefish relation at redshift zero is pretty much established. There is um, no debate about it so far. Uh, it can be used to determine distances with using red bands and W50, which will give you the smallest vertical scatter to infer the luminosity. However, the extremely tight uh, baryonic if telefish relation is based on baryonic mass can be flat from the rotation curve, still raises challenges to galaxy formation and evolution models because they need to account for almost zero scatter on it. And, um, and there is a quite a tension with the slope, which is almost getting correct. So that's what we, we know everything about it at redshift zero. However, what we're trying to understand is, is there any evolution? Will it evolve? how, which evolution do we expect? Because if we think that the galaxies form in dark matter halos, they go through entire life. So if there is a large evolution, it will tell us about the imbalances of halo and galaxy formation, so maybe merger trees. However, so far, there is no definitive answer. Does Bernie Fisher evolve? And if it evolves, how? Because we don't have a reliable tracer with which we can compare from redshift zero all the way. Higher, for example, CO rotation curves have been used to test for evolution, and it was found that no evolution is expected up to 0 0.3. Optical rotation curves, like from a alpha or, or tree, whatever line you like, also can be used to studies, and they predict that there is some evolution. If we look at higher redshifts with the optical rotation curves, some of them predict that evolution only of the slope or only of the 0 0.3. So there is no definitive answer, and we don't even know for one billion years what is happening. So it's exactly what we wanted to look at. First of all, we were wondering, can we even construct a fissure because we don't have much spectral resolution. And in the past, those galaxies which I showed you, they were 175 galaxies, most definite telefissure at redshift zero, and they all look pretty much like this. They are very nearby, they are very resolved. We needed to deal with something like this on the same scale. Ours only been three resolution elements or radio beams across. They are not very pretty and flat rotation curves. For example, the rotation curve for this galaxy look like this. Most of our rotation curves look like this or even with smaller data points. And from this, from 174 galaxies we constructed, we were able to get a sample of 68 galaxies with resolved rotation curves. And the largest sample at redshift zero is 175. So we are not doing this bad, but we are covering much further into the redshift space. And we, and yeah, the biggest caveat was, of course, we lost the resolution. We couldn't do much about this. However, what we found, of course, we find that there is no evolution up to redshift zero point. 08, so 1 billion years, which is already exciting because we step by step start to put some constraints, which we already can see. Uh, and this week we're able to construct two telefissures based on W50, so just width of the profile which traces V max and the V out. So since we cannot be sure that we trace the flat part of rotation curve, and in fact, just three data points, and of the V out and up to the stretch it, and we find that, of course, there is no evolution. However, if we will look at the Simba hydro simulation for comparison, the situation is still not very clear. The evolution is expected for W50, but not that much for V flat up to 0 0.1. So other simulations would predict absolutely different uh, constraints. So we have slowly start to compare already apples to apples from redshift 0, 1 up to the 
hopefully further with our new data for the survey. And now knowing the, we also know that up to 0 0.2, again, in cluster environment, because it's the highest H1 study has been done so far in the cluster environment, we also should not expect any evolution. However, there were many observational constraints up in this data, which we cannot say for certain that nothing is happening there. As you see, the scatter is very large, much larger. That's what we would expect from the proper measurements. <coughs> but this would allow us to apply redshift zero independent measurements, calibrations for distance estimates, which would be very useful for SK cosmology surveys, for example. And as I said, trace the halo assembly of history. And here's my conclusions. I'm pretty fast. So the H1 Marcos kinematics reveal a wealth of information which otherwise we will be missing if we would not have this tracer, this last piece of puzzle for them, for the structure and evolution of galaxies. And with all the blind new SKH1 pathfinders, we are expecting to increase our samples, increase our statistics, and increase our redshift range up to which we probe the galaxies. And yes, yeah, stay tuned. It's exciting times to be in radio astronomy and to work for the SK. <laughs> So uh, thank you, Anastasia. Uh, and yes, what kind of questions? Yeah, sorry if I went like too far for a thing, please can go back too fast for everything. Um, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I was wondering what sort of our eventual redshifts of low mass galaxies using H1 data rather than the gear. I think the top two is very expensive. Yes, good questions. We're actually doing this. And we are collaborating with the SK Cosmology Redshift Survey to provide all the missing redshifts for galaxies as far as we can detect because each one is perfect for this study. And so can you estimate, um, or can you comment on how far down the mass quantity you can go? I mean, can I see a 28 solar mass galaxy? Or could I make this on a redshift? Uh, I have some definitely not with precursors. I, I used to have a plot for what our predictions for me cut. Yeah, so if you uh, go back one slide, um, yeah, that one. So I so you're plotting MH1 versus M star, right? Yes, and I think, um. When you go into the dwarf regime, you only see things which are which have high MH1, which kind of makes sense because yeah. you need the gap, right? You have to the gap source. So will SKA be able to will, will SKA be able to fill in Yes, SK for sure will SK one even will. I, I have this plot which is extended up to redshift point zero point six, but you already see our detection limit is the black line. So we will not we will not but yes. Scale yes, yes, definitely. It will be more sensitive. And the, the survey design so far is definitely like we already being able to detect in H1 mass 10 to the 9 up to range of 0 0.1. So with this case, that gap definitely will be filled. And H1 is perfect for this range of things. That would be very important for what we get out of the team. All we have is that. Even you do equity fitting, uh, which will give you a photo view of quite a lot. Yeah, it's it's very large here. Or we do SDM and that works the same as our And for the worst, you cannot do actual like optical photon, optical spectroscopy because there is not many things to look yeah. at. Yes, yeah, so plus we will need to mm -hmm. find this more. Yeah, so definitely with the scale that what will be filled because H1 ratchet are very nice. I guess. So the points are how they are quite different yeah. from each other. Can you explain why, for example, you would have mass quantity in the H1 galaxies and why even with the 
So this is all stuck. Um, the green points and my teach one is stacking and the purple point is intensity mapping experiment. So it's very different um, uh, technique. And here, since you stack, you also need to infer some color of the galaxies, but because you know, you need to know the sample, how you stack. And I think here are the differences. But uh, we also find very different scaling relations from stacking based on our, based on my TH1 and uh, the GMRT team. So we are trying to reconcile them, but so far we are pretty much off each other. And the stacking, it's uh, what we know for sure that we stacking on spec Z. So we, we have all the spectroscopic redshifts to stack. So maybe that's the thing. But yeah, I don't know exactly because the prescriptions are very different. So yeah, they're still looking at it because uh, the PhD student who was leading, leading all the stacking experiments is now graduating. But yeah, he's been looking at it to understand what's going on. More questions? Any questions online? So uh, I've got a question. Uh, so for somebody who doesn't work with yeah. uh, meerkat like data, how? How much data is there with this and is there difficulty with data volume? Yes. Yes, no, we completely stuck the cluster in South Africa and they hate us for this because we have um, a person who is reducing our data and he's fantastic at Ian Haywood. I'm pretty sure many of you heard about him. And yeah, this is basically like one inch point you one slice of HTM cube over 10,000 channels would be around 10 terabytes, and we have like hundreds of them. So the data volume has been massive, and it was very hard to deal with in terms of storage. So we are now trying to move everything from SK side to the Oxford side because they're buying more storage. And so. No, it's been very hard. Any more questions? Yeah. And I guess uh, also another idea. I mean, with that data volume, we presume you haven't actually been able to search as much as this. You've been looking for the very targeted things as well. So no, we're actually doing blind search finders. But this is also one of the challenges we have because in H1, things are correlated like in 3D. So in order to find the source, we need we, we cannot do just like um, the stars in 2D. We also need to link it in velocity where the position will, will shift in every channel. So now the source finders for, for H1 galaxies have been developing, but they're not there yet. And we have a lot of like, for example, RFI residual or some continuum subtraction residual would still be identified as a source. So what we do, we do automatic search, which needs visual inspection so far. However, we will not be able to deal with our full volume data with to do like this, to look at all like 10,000 galaxies. So that's what, what is our, one of the challenge we're working on is for the source finding. Yeah. 